Venice. The name alone conjures images of art-peddling vendors, free-flowing canals, eccentric street performers, and a diverse community. Surfing in Venice is a recent phenomenon, rising in popularity over the last century. But as recent as 50 years ago, Venice's surfing scene excluded many people of color, particularly African Americans. When the beaches were segregated, like black people couldn't go surf Malibu, they couldn't walk onto the beach to get to the water. But, so they had to paddle, I think from Santa Monica all the way to Malibu to be able to surf at Malibu and then probably paddle back because they couldn't get off the beach anywhere. You know, um, it's pretty amazing what, what people are willing to do when um, faced with, with, with obstacles, you know, such as, as racism and things like that, you know, and segregation. I know all about the inkwell segregation. I'm all into that good stuff. Um, I actually surf there a lot just because, even though the waves suck there, <laughs> I actually just surf there a lot just because of the history. It means a lot actually because it's like now we can just go wherever. I can go get in my car and just go surf at whatever beach and just, you know, do my thing. But it's kind of cool to always go there and just look back and just think about, just look out to the to horizon, just think about uh, different stuff that went on here. Hawaiian-born surfer George Fries arrived in Venice Beach in 1907 and made surfing a spectator sport. Soon after, he invited fellow surfer and Olympic swimmer Duke Kahanamaku to California, making surfing so popular in Venice that its reputation as a surfing hotspot became permanent. Another prolific surfer, Nick Gabaldon, is to surfing what Jackie Robinson is to baseball. He gained notoriety for his rigorous dedication to the sport and his habit to paddle 12 miles on his surfboard from Santa Monica to Malibu. This was his way of rebelling against segregation laws that confined African Americans to their designated stretch of beach that was known as the Inkwell. Today, groups like the Black Surfers Collective are working hard to make sure the diversity issue stays in the past. There is more diversity in surfing these days, yes, absolutely. We're not necessarily trying to make surfers of people. We're more trying to introduce people to the ocean and, and, and coming to the beach through our surfing. So giving them something fun to do, but making sure they come out to the beach and experience the whole thing. And um, so if they become surfers, that's great. But if they don't, at least they've, they've had an adventure and something that pushed them outside their box. My life is really about getting outside my box and finding out um, different things in life that I, w I could experience that have taught me uh, to go ahead and try different things. I grew up here in Venice Beach, California my whole life. I'm 44 years old. I um, grew up skateboarding under guys like Jay Adams and Tony Alva and all those guys are all my mentors. And then there was another generation of guys that are, um, that are like Eric Dressen and you know the 80s generation. and. Um, all of those guys had surf influence in their life, you know what I mean? When I was a kid growing up in here, first off, there was only a handful of young black kids who were skating um, to begin with, let alone surfing. I maybe knew four or five older guys, if that, there were black men that, that, that surfed, that grew up here in Santa Monica. Um, and then there was a few from the inner cities that skated, but then they also surfed, you know, because they grew up there in the 70s and it was such a different time. They were kind of outcasts, but they were doing their own thing, you know what I mean? So yeah, this, is, this has been my life, it's been, it's been good. And like I said, when I was a kid, there wasn't that many black surfers to even look up to. You know, it was predominantly a white sport, or if you were an islander, you know, Hawaiians were, were good surfers. I was actually almost embarrassed to tell my black friends that I was swimming somewhat. So they kind of found out through, after my first swim meet when I was actually winning, they would announce it at our school like who, who won in sports and then people are like, oh, you're, you're swimming. I see different treatment when I walk into a surf shop alone. You know, they, they, some, some people look at you like, like I, I shouldn't be there or I don't know what I'm talking about when I'm there. And then I started speaking about you know, my experience of, of as a surfer and they realize, okay, he's actually a surfer and then they'll help me out. So it takes a while to warm up to that. Surfing has come a long way since the days of inkwell and segregation, but it still has miles left to paddle before it can leave its troubled history in the past. Usually when I go out to like a different surf break, people give me like the weirdest looks, because they're like, all right, uh, it's a black guy out here, he doesn't, probably doesn't know what he's doing. And then I get a wave and I'm just like shredding and like most of the people just stay out of my way, because I'll yell at you in the water, I don't care. <laughs> but yeah, usually, uh, yeah, I, I paddled out with a bunch of black guys. I taught a bunch of my friends how to surf. I've been teaching surf lessons for like eight years, so I taught a bunch of my friends how to surf. So yeah, I paddled out with a bunch of dudes you probably wouldn't think 
have surfboards in our hands. We had just finished surfing at um, Hermosa Beach, which is a spot that we frequently go to. You know, we, that's one of our main spots. Um, a car, a car was driving by. It was, a, I, I specifically remember the truck too. It was a lifted like Chevy truck, like dried up mud all over it, and. The dude, a dude yelled out. Well, first, first he threw up a, a shaka, so we thought he was friendly, so we were starting to do it back. And he said, "Surfs up, niggers." And so we both kind of looked at each other, like, like we didn't, we didn't like. It, it was so fast that it happened. You know, by the time we looked up, like the dude was like speeding off, like tires screeching. So we, we really didn't know what to do at first because it, it just, it completely caught us off guard. We went home, told his parents about it, and his parents, you know, being older, they're kind of like. Yeah, that's the reality we live in. Like, you can't be upset about it. You know, it happened. So we were like, but we, we were shocked at how you know all of our parents took it because they were like, yeah. like, well, yeah, it happens, but it's like it was new to us. When you're in the water and the only other people of color that you see in the water, the people you came with, you realize that it's a pretty limited number. But when I start bumping into uh, young African Americans or, or uh, Hispanic uh, men and women, boys and girls in the water, uh, Asians in the water, it, it just shows that it's really integrated quite a bit. And like I said, we may be different here in Southern California, but I, I definitely embrace it. And, and big up to anybody that wants to serve, black, white, Mexican. I mean, everybody should be open to it. It is for everybody. This world, everything in it is for all of us. So we should all be able to take part. So if someone says, oh, you shouldn't do that because it's for this class of people or that class of people, that none of that really matters. Um, there was black people before me that showed me that it was capable I was capable of doing it and then I have also been a catalyst for other young people and I'm sure that there are other young people who will do the same you know it's just it's it's a continuum the limits are all in our own heads you know that we have been planted you can do anything if you try and it also it just it kind of got rid of fear a little bit there's nothing to really worry about you just go try things you can do it and the sky is the limit.